going to look at the house of Israel. And I wonder if we can look at uh, Exodus chapter 3 um, and verses 6 to 10, which says this. Uh, God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I tell you, we need more of that, don't we? I mean, we, you know, God showed up in a great way last week and it was, you know, we, none of us wanted to move, hey? You know, it's kind of a little bit of what we're talking about here, you know, that God's actually doing amongst us. But um, it, I've got to say, before I go any further, it concerns me uh, when Christians talk about um, having visions and angelic visitations and stuff like that, and it just kind of, they're blasé about it. I don't see anywhere in the Word of God where you can be blasé about that kind of encounter with God. <laughs> You know, I mean, Moses hid his face. You know, when, when John encountered Jesus in Revelation, he fell to the ground as though he was dead. You know, if, we're gonna, if, if we really have visitations from God, then I don't think we can just stand and talk about it like, well, you know, I had steak on Tuesday night and then Jesus showed up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, huh? I think if it's, if it's real, it's going to impact our lives. You know, and Moses here, he said, he's at the burning bush and, and God says, this is who I am. And the, his response to the revelation of who God was uh, to him was that Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look on him because it was such an awesome, incredible experience encountering God in this way. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Promites and Marmites and Vegemites. <laughs> oh dear. Verse 9. Now therefore... Behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm, I'm talking about the heart of a deliverer, and Moses had to have this burning bush encounter with God in order to be able to have the right kind of heart, and he had to, he had to actually uh, develop God's heart in order to do what God wanted. You see, God wanted to deliver his people, but he needed Moses and he called Moses to be the person to, to, uh, to, to be his point man, if you will, you know, the, the, to be his, his face in front of the people, you know, to be the guy who they recognize, well, yes, this is who's leading us. Uh, and they also knew that God was leading him. And they knew, of course, that God was leading them uh, because of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that went before them. And they didn't move unless, unless God moved. And the way God moved was that the pillar of cloud would move. It was daytime. At nighttime, the, that pillar of cloud turned into fire. And so if they moved at night, the pillar of fire would move. And so they knew that God was leading them, but they also knew that Moses was their, their leader and God's representative, if you will. But, you know, the thing is that to, for Moses to be a deliverer, he had to do it as God's representative, but that meant he had to have God's kind of heart. That's why he had to have the burning bush experience. You know, uh, supernatural encounters with God are not so that we can just kind of have something exciting to, to tell one another. It does build our faith and gets us pretty excited and, and, uh, and inspired about living for Jesus and about what God's doing when we're able to share those things with one another. But you know, God's got a plan for his people. His plan here was to deliver them from 400 years of slavery. And you know, God's got a plan for our city of Brisbane. God wants to deliver people out of darkness into light. He wants to deliver people out of bondage into freedom. He wants to deliver people out of confusion into peace. He wants to deliver people out of, uh, out of hurt and, and damage into healing and wholeness. And he's looking for people who are going to be like Moses, who are going to have an encounter with him, who are going to walk with him, who are going to come to know him, and who are going to develop God's kind of heart so that we can actually go out the, as though it was God himself doing it. That's an amazing thought, eh? But we are supposed to be ambassadors of the king, which means that when we go, it's as though the king goes. That's what the kingdom's about. You see, the kingdom's not about church. Church is us getting together for the sake of the kingdom. The word church, I don't know if you know this, the word church means those who are called out. 
So the whole concept of destiny is actually embodied in, even in the, the word church. It's about Moses here. His name means the one who was drawn out. Same concept. He was drawn out for a purpose. You know, we're called out of the world for God's purpose. That's what the church is. God's purpose is to advance his kingdom on this planet. And uh, God's looking for people who are going to put their hand up and say, I want to be your representative. I want to be a deliverer. And I want to have your kind of heart so that when I touch people, they know that somehow God's in the whole thing. Yeah? Yeah? Do you know, this week um, I had to put my van in, well, it's really the church van, um, <laughs> for some work. And uh, when I first went to this, um, uh, this mechanic, I, I was recommended to this guy and I went down there and he had a look at the van and we talked about it and, um, and so on. And, and anyway, there's this young lady who works in his office. She's probably in her mid to late 20s. And uh, I had to uh, uh, sit in the office and wait while they rang up about parts and all this kind of thing. And she came out and said, look, would you like me to make you a cup of coffee? And of course, coffee... Yes, always, you know, so, <laughs> so um, she made me a cup of coffee and we, we just got talking about just general stuff, you know, so that was it and yet in that conversation I just sensed something about life, God wanted to do something, so then um, I took the van down this week uh, to get the work done and uh, I dropped it off there and, and uh, the, the owner of the company lent me his car. But then they had to keep the van in overnight. And he rang me and said, look, Phil, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to get my car back because I've got no other way of getting home tonight. He said, <laughs> I said, well, if I bring your car back, I've got no way of getting home. So uh, what are we going to do? You know? And he said, um, he said look, I'll, I'll, I'll get Carolyn to drive you home. I said, great. So I took his car back and she drove me home. You know, we got just maybe two or three hundred metres away from the workshop. And she said to me, so what do you do for a living? <laughs> I said, I lead a church up at Tingalpa. And she looked over at me and she said, you're exactly the person I need to talk to. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Do you know, for half an hour, I shared the gospel with that girl. And she asked question after question after question. She said, I've never understood this. Tell me, you know. And on and on we went. And by the time she dropped me off down here at Wynnum West, um, I wanted to pray with her, but I just felt a restraint. I just felt like, no, there's, there's going to be a time, you know. But, you see, God's calling us all to live differently. Yes. To live differently. Because it's not about I go to church and I go home and I go to work. We are the church. The king lives in us. The kingdom's in us. So, wherever we are, it's exactly the same. Wherever we are. So whether Moses was in the back of the desert, or whether he was standing before Pharaoh, or whether he was talking to the elders of Israel, it didn't matter where he was, or if he went home to see his mum and his family, it didn't matter where he was, he was still a deliverer. Amen. He was still God's man. Yeah? See, it doesn't matter where we are, God doesn't see us or his purpose for our lives any differently. He doesn't think, oh, they're being spiritual this morning, they're lost in worship. Because he actually looks at us and, and is looking for worship every day from us. It's just that it's different when we come together than when we're on our own during the week. But we're called to be worshippers. Yeah? So we come on Sunday and we, we, we give our tithes and offerings. So are we only givers on Sunday? I sure hope not. Because <laughs> the kingdom is about giving. It's about blessing. It's about being generous. It's about pouring it out, isn't it? Yeah. And so when we come and give our tithes and offerings, that's just an expression of who we are as kingdom people. Yeah? If it's not, then we're going to struggle with giving on Sunday because it's not actually who we are. We're going to struggle with giving a word of encouragement or, or uh, you know, some kind of practical help because it's not who we are. If we're kingdom people, then it's going to just manifest itself. Yeah? And uh, that's what we see with Moses. Didn't matter where he was. Where, didn't matter which house he was in, you know, he was still a deliverer, but in order to actually go and fulfill the destiny God had called him to, he had to actually have God's heart. He had to take on the heart of a deliverer. It couldn't be a job. It couldn't be something where he lived a certain way in his tent and then the, the, the uh, problems would come to him and he'd, he'd be like, oh, that's right, I'm the deliverer. I should actually, you know, and it's not, it's not like putting another hat on. See, church life has been so far below what God has wanted, I believe. Yeah? Where we put different hats on. Isn't that true? 
You know, so on Sunday I put the preacher hat on. Guess what? I don't. Because on Wednesday, or whenever it was, Thursday, I had the preacher hat on in that BMW driving from Slacks Creek to Wynnum West with that, that young lady. <laughs> you see, we're called to be preachers every day of our lives because it's supposed to be who we are, not what we do. Yeah? We're called to be prayers. It's not like, oh, I should pray. Well, yeah, maybe we should pray more, but, you know. But if, if, if it's who we are, if we're kingdom people, then we're prayers. Because that's how we communicate with God. Yeah? Absolutely. And so in this story here of Moses, the thing that inspires me is that he goes to the back of the desert out to Midian. And what's the first thing he does? He delivers. Delivers uh, Jethro's daughters from the others who came to, you know, to, to harass them. Yeah. What does God do when he shows up here in these verses we've read and, and says, look, this is what I want to do. He says, I've come down to deliver the people. Guess what? Moses was not surprised because he was talking Moses' language. Because Moses is a deliverer. He can't help it. It's who he is. We're prayers, we're worshippers, we're givers, we're deliverers, we're preachers, we're, you know, I mean the list goes on. Why? Because we're kingdom people. Yes, we've all got a call in God and, uh, you know, as I've said many times, we, you know, want to help you to, to define that and to, to discover it and to be able to develop it and, and, uh, and put a coaching track in to be able to, to actually fulfill your calling and to have the right foundation and develop the right giftings and abilities and all those kind of things. But you know what? I think a lot of Christians don't fulfill their primary calling because they actually don't know how to be kingdom people. Yeah? But if we know how to be a kingdom person, this is who I am. The king lives in me. I'm his ambassador. I'm his representative. I'm called to pray. I'm called to read the word. You know, I'm called to, to preach. I'm called to encourage. I'm called to worship. I'm called to give. I'm called to... I mean, the list goes on, doesn't it? Because the king lives in me. It's part of who I am. And so therefore, it's not about I go to church. It is genuinely... I am the church. Wherever I am, it just happens at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. This is where this particular part of the whole of the church you know, general gathers together to worship and you know and praise Him and you know and, and all the stuff we do. And we'll have other times as as as, as the, the church develops and when we get together in different ways and for different reasons. But you know what? This is this is not the church. This is us getting together. To be the church gathered, you know. Out in the week, I don't like the word scattered. It's been said many times, you know, the church gathered, the church scattered. I don't like the word scattered. I think it's the church gathered and then the church in purpose yeah. out there. The church in purpose. The church in mission. Every day we're, we're on a mission, you know. Anyone into the Blues Brothers? <laughs> Look, if you're going to be part of a Garpe church, you've got to be in the... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> just stirring all right but you know I, um it's always stuck with me you know we're on a mission from god you know <laughs> they weren't really but we are we are we are amen all right i want to give you five things out of this passage actually i'm going to go back to uh, the last part of of chapter two because it actually condenses it uh everything pretty much that's in the verses we read is condensed into three verses at the end of uh, chapter 2 and um, it says there the first thing I want to talk about is about hearing what God hears if we're going to develop the heart of a deliverer we've got to hear what God hears and there's just a yeah I'm going to pull out some big words today there's just a cacophony of sound that comes at us every day isn't that true we just all sorts of sounds isn't it you turn the tv on you turn the radio on you know there's the traffic there's there's the neighbours, there's, I mean, on and on it goes, you know, there's, there's just stuff everywhere. There's all kinds of things. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to hear God speaking to us. But it's not just that. We've got to hear what God hears when, it, when you know, in the society we live in. Do you know that here it says that, that um, in verse 23 of chapter 2, the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. Oh, they're a bunch of losers. They should get their act together, shouldn't they? <laughs> No, all right. They groaned because of the bondage and they cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning. What do we hear? What do we hear? 
You know, when we encounter people who rub us the wrong way, what do we hear? Do we hear what God hears? Ooh. <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? But you know, there was all of these people, a whole nation in bondage. And God heard their cry. He heard the cry of their heart. Isn't that amazing? God hears the cry of people's hearts. He hears the cry of our hearts. That's, that uh, is so comforting, isn't it? God hears the cry of our hearts. But you know, if we're going to be deliverers and going to make a difference on His behalf, then we've got to be able to hear what He hears. So what is God hearing from this city? What is God hearing from our neighbours? What is God hearing from the people we work with? You know, or, or go to uni with, or to school, or you know, the, the guy at the service station, or, or whatever. You know, I got, got petrol near, near our place the other day, and, and um, the guy, when I went in to pay, he said, uh, so how's your day? I said, actually pretty good. I said, how's yours? He went, oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought, now that's actually unprofessional in this position. He's not supposed to do that. You know, he's supposed, he's supposed to actually, you know, be on top and, you know, do the right PR thing and Except that I think people are actually lowering the, the guard more and more, you know. I don't know about you, but I'm finding people who are hungry, who are looking for something everywhere I go. And you know what? If we can hear what's really coming out of their hearts, because that's what God hears. If we can hear the cry of their heart, then we have something that can meet that cry. We have something that can be a, a response that will actually bring them to a place where ultimately we're going to find people are going to put their trust in Jesus. Where people are going to have a different perspective of life. Where people are going to actually begin to put a, a right foundation in their lives. But we've got to, in order to have the heart of a deliverer, we've got to be able to hear what God hears. Because if we can't hear the cry, our heart can't be moved by the cry. Yeah? You see, everything Jesus did was he was moved with compassion. Moved with compassion. You know, and through the worship, we talked about the love of God towards us. And everything that, 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 that uh, you know, God has done is motivated by His love for us. But if we can't hear what God hears that's in people's hearts, then our hearts can't be moved like God's heart's moved. And you see, Moses needed to learn this stuff in order to develop the right kind of heart as a deliverer so that when he was under the pump, so that when the people murmured and complained, that he would have the kind of heart that God had towards them. In order to be able to do what God wanted in that situation. Amen? But number two, we've got to think what God thinks. It says in verse 24, And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So here's this whole nation, God's chosen people. They're in bondage, they're slaves. They've been there for 400 years. And all they can do is cry out to God. because, And they're groaning under the... the uh, you know, under the pressure and under the, uh, the what they're suffering and so on. And, um, and God hears this groaning. But what is it that turns God's heart towards them? It's what he thinks. You know, we, we're so full of um, prejudices, aren't we? True? We are. We're so full of prejudices. And I'm not just talking about racial prejudice. I mean, prejudice is not just racial. It's, you know, we're prejudiced against all kinds of things. You know, some people are prejudiced against old people. Some people are prejudiced against young people. Some people are prejudiced against redheads with fair skin. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? We all have these things in our thinking, you know. Do you know if God had a prejudice against groaning people, what would he have thought when he heard that cry? <laughs> Thank goodness he didn't, doesn't have a prejudice against groaning people. Yeah? Because when we groan, we need God to think the right thing. <laughs> Isn't that true? We really do. What did he think here? He thought, I have established a covenant with these people. He thought, I have actually given myself a responsibility towards these people. That's what God thought. He didn't say, oh man, I'm sick of these people. All they ever do is groan, complain, whinge. <laughs> If they'd work a bit harder, like 24 hours a day, they might be able to get out of their bondage. <laughs> but see, God doesn't think that way because God doesn't have prejudices like we do. So when we hear what God hears, what do we think? This is challenging stuff, isn't it? But I want to tell you that 
if, if, we can, if we can allow God to do a work in us, it's going to change how we live. Because our responses to, to situations and to people is determined by having the right kind of heart. And these, I think, are the keys to developing that heart, you know. So what did God think? God thought, I have a covenant with these people. In fact, it's been a generational covenant already. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And now it's Joseph and his brothers, you know. It's already been there for four generations. Well, longer than that, actually. Because they've been in, in, in Egypt for 400 years. So a whole bunch of generations. And God said, I can hear this groaning. And it comes up all the time. It just comes up continually from Goshen down there. And this groaning comes up to me. And I remember that I've made a covenant with these people. So my thoughts are that I need to do something on the basis of my covenant towards these people. Isn't that good? Do you know, God still responds like that. God still thinks that way. When, G when he sent Jesus, he made a covenant with his creation that he would redeem his creation. And God is still thinking that way. Isn't that good? Man, I'm so glad about that. Otherwise, I'd be on my way to hell, big time. And I don't think I'm the only one in the room. <laughs> yeah. God remembered his covenant. What is the foundation of God's response in, in his thoughts? towards our needs and so on, it's a, it's, his response is, I have given my son because I love these people. I've established a covenant that's eternal with these people. So I want to deliver these people. Do you know when God looks at the city of Brisbane, he's thinking the same stuff. And he's looking for people who are going to think the same stuff. And guess who he's talking to about that? About that? Me? You? <laughs> don't know about the other churches but that's not our responsibility our responsibility is here to hear what God is saying and I believe God's saying that he wants to raise up a body of people here in Agape Church that will actually represent his love out there and how is that going to happen it's going to happen because we have the right kind of heart and it's the heart of a deliverer it's the same heart Jesus had it's the heart of a redeemer a heart of a who, that wants to, to engage in the ministry of reconciliation it's the heart that says, I can hear what God hears. I can hear the cry in people's hearts. I can hear the, the, the desperation. You know, I can hear uh, you know, the, the, the heartache. I can hear the hurt. I can, I, I can hear the hopelessness. And am I going to close the door And because it's all too much? No. Because it's not about us having to do it all. It's the fact that we represent the king who wants to do it. And he wants to do it through us. Isn't that good? Yeah. And so... How we think is really important. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. We, most of us would know this. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. To give you a future and a hope. Thoughts of peace. To give you a future and a hope. How did God respond to the stuff that went on in Israel? Yeah, there was times like he said to Moses, I'm going to kill a lot of them. But guess what? Moses had so captured God's kind of heart that Moses turned around and said you can't do that they're your people Moses was kind of saying no way I'm not going to let you do that because he had caught God's heart for God's people so even when God got to well I don't know that God gets to the end of himself but you know what I'm saying when God got to the stage that he said I'm going to destroy them and start again with you Moses because you're my man Moses said no you can't do that that's not your heart that's not your nature you know and I think that we need to so capture God's heart that we think uh, the way God would think about people on the basis of his covenant that he's established with us and, and with the city we live in, you know, the world we live in. And it's a, what does God think? He thinks thoughts of peace to give us a future and a hope. And God wants us to bring that kind of hope into people's lives wherever we go. Because they're out there and they're, they're, they're wanting it. And, and if our ears are tuned, we'll hear the cry. And then if our hearts are, are God's kind of heart, then we're going to think this way. We're going to think, hey, God, what, Lord, what have you got for this person? How can I bring a message of hope? How can I encourage them? How can I lift them? How can I speak about re redemption into their lives in a way that they'll respond? How can I make a difference wherever I go? Do you know there's, there's so many believers who, who are um, disconnected and, and, and disheartened and, and so on out there. In fact, I kind of wonder if there's more Christians not in fellowship than in fellowship. You know, what a tragedy. I mean, that's a mission field in itself for us, isn't it? You know, people who need to be delivered out of the deception of the enemy, out of the, 
the bondage that's come because they've uh, allowed hurts to take root in their life or, and all kinds of things that have happened. You know, it, it's, it's tragic what's happened in the, in the kingdom because the kingdom's divided. And a kingdom divided can't stand. Why are we not more powerful in this nation? It's because we haven't got a united front as the kingdom of God. But you know, and so God wants us to deliver those people who are a part of the kingdom but not functioning and, and, and who are confused and, and hurt and so on out there. They, they need to come back into fellowship with God in a real and a powerful way. They also need to come back into fellowship with God's people, not just so that they're you know, a member of a church, but so that they can be in, in places where they can get fired up again, get the life of God flowing again. And get functioning, you know, as, 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 as ambassadors of Jesus again. And begin to fulfill their destiny. And have become fruitful again and be fulfilled again. Man, it, it, I've got to tell you, it breaks my heart when I meet Christians who, who are just so far away from where they could be. But if we've got God's kind of heart, we're going to think the way God thinks about them. And we're going to want to bring, bring hope into their lives. Amen? Yep. Number three, to uh, have the heart of a deliverer, we've got to see what God sees. It says in verse 25, God looked on the, uh, the children of Israel. Uh, the, the verses in chapter, chapter 3 that we read in verse 7, he said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. I have surely seen the oppression of my people. You know, we've got to be able to see what God sees. In Matthew 9, 4 and also Luke 5, 22. Did you get those two if you're taking notes? Matthew 9, 4 and Luke 5, 22. Jesus perceived what was in their hearts. We, we need this kind of stuff, don't we? Otherwise, we're just kind of bouncing off people like everybody else does. And even with one another, you know? Because the temptation, even when we get together on a Sunday, is to kind of, you know, how are you going? Oh, yeah, great. You know, how's your week been? Yeah, great, you know? And yet, God sees into our hearts. And to, to have the heart of a deliverer, we've got to be able to do that. That's why Jesus was so effective. He saw what was in people's hearts. Now, this isn't a negative thing. This isn't like trying to uncover things that are private. No, this is, this is about you know, having compassion and wanting to actually minister into people's lives. Wanting to do what Jesus would do if he was here. Seeing what God sees. God looked down from heaven. He'd heard the cry. He, he reminded himself about the covenant that he had. So he, that, his thoughts were... Thoughts of peace to give them a future and a hope. And so then he looked. He looked closer. And when he looked, he saw oppression. You know, like I jokingly said before about, you know, why don't you, you know, a bunch of losers get it together kind of thing. But you know what, that's how our society is, isn't that true? And we can be so affected by that without even realising. But if that's the case, then we're never going to be deliverers. But if we see what God sees, which is the heart, not the outward manifestation, not the, but begin to see what God's doing in people's hearts, begin to see the state of people's hearts, boy, what a difference it makes. Number four, we've got to feel what God feels. It says that God acknowledged them. God acknowledged them. You know, if we go over to, um, um, we, we can see that God felt their pain. Right, in verse 7 of chapter 3, I know their sorrows. Isn't that amazing? I know their pain. That's really what the word is. I know their pain. See, God felt the pain they were feeling. The Bible talks about us weeping with those who weep and, and, and um, laughing with those who laugh. Do you know that's feeling what God feels? Because God feels what's in people's hearts. That's a great thought, isn't it? So when, when stuff happens in our lives and, and, and we're feeling all kinds of stuff, guess what? God feels that. If there's pain, God feels it. But you know what? This is not just comfort for us. But if we can understand that this is how God's heart works, then we can actually develop the kind of heart God has so that he can use us in our city. But we've got to feel what God feels for that to happen. We've got to feel people's pain. Yeah? We've got to feel their pain. We've got to feel their confusion. We've got to feel their, their uh, hopelessness. Now, the thing about this is that for the last 20 or 30 years, the church has been going on a whole different track from this. It's all about success, prosperity, you know, all of that stuff. 
and I'm not against success and prosperity. The only thing is I think that feeling what God feels makes us successful in God's eyes. <laughs> what do you reckon? Makes us successful in God's eyes. Who do we want to be, in whose eyes do we want to be successful? You know? I've said it before, there, there are things that I could, I could do and have done in the past that would draw a crowd into this place. But I'm preaching stuff that actually the crowd doesn't want to hear. <laughs> because I want to build a place that is a, a true representation of the kingdom. That we raise up a church that is a kingdom minded people. Not just a, a crowd of people who come and go and, and, just, and, and are only here because it's the most successful new thing around. I've done that in the past. But you know, that's not going to please God. And that's not actually what God wants to do. God actually wants to advance his kingdom. And he's looking for people who are so um, committed to him and his kingdom that they actually want to become kingdom people and want to live it out and want to make a difference. And so to do that and to be successful in God's eyes, we got to feel what God feels. Because it's not about how big the crowd is. It's, did I actually... Do what the Holy Spirit prompted me to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's challenging stuff, isn't it? See, it's not about us. It's about Him. Amen. He's the Lord of the church. He's the King over it all. And it's, so it's not about us. It's about Him. And we've got to do what He wants. We've got to feel what He feels, you know? We've got to hear what He hears, think what He thinks, see what He sees, and feel what He feels on the inside. Then we're going to actually make a difference in people's lives. We're going to make a difference everywhere we go. Yeah. And you know what? The greatest joy is doing this. The greatest joy is not kind of being able to say, well, I go to the hottest church in town. That doesn't bring joy. That just builds our pride. Come on, let's be honest about this stuff. It's not about that. You know, I, I believe we, the Agape Church is going to become a great church. Be significant in the city and make a, a huge difference. What the numbers are, who knows? Who cares? Because it's not about how big we are. It's about how big God is in us. And it's about how big our influence is. So we might be 200 people, we might be 2,000 people, but I don't care. As long as we become a people who actually begin to become deliverers in the city and become to salt and light like never before and begin to advance the kingdom wherever we go, then God's going to see, that, see our hearts and he's going to begin to honour that and he's going to begin to move. Yeah? And I, I don't know about you, but there's something that just burns inside me. I, 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 want, I don't want to be the person doing the stuff that pulls a crowd. I want to see us all be, being fruitful. All of us being fruitful. Because then when we come together on Sunday, man, we've all got a testimony then. You know where it says that in, in uh, one of the epistles, you know, about they came with a psalm and a hymn and a spiritual song and this and that and everything else. How does that happen? It's not like, oh, I'm going to church, I've got to select a song. It's not. It's that if we're living the way I'm talking about this morning, then stuff's going to be overflowing out of our lives. And we're going to be blessing one another when we come together on Sunday. And then when we go home after Sunday, to home, we're going to be blessing the people at home, you know. But you understand what I'm saying? Hey, I think we've got to turn the thing back on its right, right way up. That it's not about all the pizzazz and all the outward stuff and, and all that. It's about... What's God saying to us and how are we responding to that and what are we doing? What are we allowing him to do in us and through us? That's what it's about. Amen. We're going to feel what God feels. Luke 19, 41. Jesus came near the city of Jerusalem and when he saw the city, he wept over it because he said, Jerusalem, if only you knew what was coming your way. If only you knew that this was your day. If only you knew, you know, you see, you can feel what. Jesus is feeling there, hey? He wept over the city because he saw that they weren't actually uh, recognizing that this was God's time for them and that the future could be so different if they responded differently. And it broke his heart. He wept over the city. How did it happen? He saw what was really going on. He didn't just see, you know, a whole lot of flat top houses and narrow cobbled streets and markets going on and dust rising in the air and all the stuff that Jerusalem's about. He didn't see that stuff. He saw what was in the people's lives and what was in their future. And he saw their non-response to the fact that God had sent him. And it broke his heart. You see, what was Jesus doing? He was feeling what the Father was feeling. What did Moses do? Moses had to develop the right heart as a deliverer so that he would feel what God felt. 
And if we can come to the place of saying, God, break my heart. Let me feel what the pain people are feeling. You see, it's not a burden to do that. That actually is what moves our hearts. That's actually what allows God to use us to be more fruitful than we ever have been before. Is to be, have, let our hearts be moved, feel what God feels. And number five, do what God wants to do. He says in verse, um, uh, chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, um, I have surely visited you. This is the last part of the verse. I have surely visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to, a land, to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and all that, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Isn't that brilliant? What did God want to do? He wanted to deliver the people and he wanted to lead them to fulfill their destiny. That was God's plan. And you know what? God's plan hasn't changed. God wants to deliver people and lead them to fulfill their destiny. But God doesn't want to come down from heaven and take a form again himself to do it. He's already sent Jesus to do that. And when Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit, another one the same as him, who would be with us at all times so that we could continue to do what Jesus came to do. Which is to deliver and disciple people to fulfill their destiny. That's, that, that's the bottom line, isn't it? To deliver people and disciple them to fulfill their destiny. Do you know in uh, John 6, 38, John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said, I have come to do the will of my Father who sent me. He said, I haven't come to do my own thing. I've come to do the will of the Father who sent me. Do you know, if we hear what God hears and thinks, think what God thinks and see what God sees and feel what God feels, then guess what? We'll do what God wants to do. Because we'll have the same heart motivation that God has. And because of the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to do it. So what was it that Jesus said that God had sent him to do? Luke 4, 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, which of course he quoted from Isaiah. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, good news, to the poor. To heal the, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. <laughs> what an amazing anointing that is. And Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. What anointing do we go in? I believe we go with the same anointing. We carry this anointing. Why is it that there's not more broken hearts healed? Why is it that there's not more captives being set free? Why is it that there's not more oppressed people being, being, you know, being lifted up in Him? Why is it that there, there isn't more people's lives changed? Why is it that we, haven't, uh, that we don't have greater influence in our city? I believe it's because we, we haven't uh, understood that as kingdom people we've got to have the heart of the King. And if we have the heart of the king, then we'll be motivated by the same love he's motivated by. And not only that, we'll find that this same anointing is going to be flowing in our lives. What does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to bring deliverance. He wants us to be like Moses. He wants us to be like him. He's called us to be deliverers. And what, a, what an awesome thing it is that we can actually speak good news to people who are lacking that. You know, we can actually bring healing into broken hearts. We can actually set people free who are bound we can actually bring a spirit of wisdom and revelation by the power of the holy spirit so eyes get opened you know not only physical eyes by the power of god but so that the eyes of their heart get opened you know in ephesians 1 paul talked about that with the ephesian church so people can get revelation insight about jesus jesus can be revealed to them isn't that amazing that we can talk to people under the anointing of the holy spirit in such a way that jesus will reveal himself to them awesome and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to lift them out of their oppression and downtroddenness, to be able to rule and reign with him in this life. I don't know about you, but I want to be more effective as a deliverer than I ever have in my life.